On the Sunday night, the loss of life is staggering even to veteran investigators. 20 people killed in a single tragic crash. It was supposed to be a celebration. They even rented a limo so no one drove drunk. So how did a day out in New York State end with the most deadly accident in the U.S. in nine years? Also tonight, an outspoken columnist enters a Saudi consulate and then vanishes. Was he murdered? And with Brett Kavanaugh on the court and Americans deeply divided, we look at what comes next. The first cases he will face, what his controversial confirmation means for the midterms. This is The National. At a time when people on both sides of the border are in the middle of a long weekend, out with friends or family, taking in the fall colors, a single stunning car accident has devastated several families in New York State. A limousine filled with friends en route to a birthday party never got there. It happened in the small town of Skokari, New York, about three hours south of the Ontario border. Our Renee Filipponi explains what happened. It started off as a day to celebrate a birthday and ended up in unimaginable tragedy. There's 20 fatalities. It's just horrific. I've been on the board for, for 12 years, and uh, this is one of the biggest losses of life, loss of lives that we've seen uh, in a long, long time. It all unfolded when the limo lost control on a very steep highway and blew through a stop sign right across the intersection and into a store parking lot. It hit an empty SUV. Then that vehicle careened into two pedestrians, killing them. The limo was carrying a group of friends, ringing in a 30th birthday. Four sisters died in the crash. Their aunt says their father is broken. I don't know how to say it. You can't wrap your head around such a tragedy where you have four of your daughters die. They love their family. They love their parents. They, they. They had, one had two little, one has two little children and one has one child. Two couples who were married just this summer also died. Alex and Amy Steenberg rented the limo in an effort to be responsible and not drink and drive. They were joined by Aaron and Shane McGowan. The newlyweds are being remembered as loving people that were fun to be around. Aaron and Shane, honestly, are both just, you know, the life of the room. They, uh, you know, up, you know, very up up people positive outgoing an investigation is now underway and police say they will be looking at a number of factors including seat belts the front seat passengers and the driver would be required to wear a seat belt uh, the passengers in the back would not now only a tire remains at the place where flowers are being laid to remember the 20 people who died and the dozens of lives who are now changed forever renee any sense about how this might have happened well, Adrian, no one questions that that limo blew through the stop sign. What investigators really want to know now is why. Now, the limo was a 2001 Ford Explorer limousine like this one, and police will be looking at the safety record of that vehicle and the company that rented it. They'll also investigate whether the driver may have been speeding, distracted, or under the influence. Now, residents in the area say this intersection is dangerous and it's been a problem in the past. The National Transportation Safety Board is on the scene and they are there not just to find out what happened, but to see if there are any gaps in safety standards to make sure a tragedy on this scale never happens again. Okay, thanks, Renee. Renee Filipponi in Vancouver tonight. Now, if this accident makes you wonder about standards and rules here in Canada, well, limo licenses are granted by municipalities. So in Toronto, for example, limo drivers are required to have a special license and the vehicle has to be inspected every six months. And to that question, they'll be asking in the U.S. about seatbelts. In Canada, provincial rules govern the use of them. So in Ontario, when fewer than eight people are in a vehicle, seatbelts are mandatory. When there are more in, say, buses or bigger limos, there's no requirement to buckle up. Here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. He received thousands of dollars in unexpected EI payments and then got dinged with a huge tax bill. Now he's going public. Plus, pot goes legal in just 10 days. So what happens to the thousands of Canadians with criminal records for possession? You'll meet one of them just ahead. But first, He's been missing for days, so is Jamal Khashoggi dead? 
He is a prominent Saudi dissident and journalist known for sharply criticizing Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Now, last week, Khashoggi disappeared without a trace. And as Derek Stoffel reports, many now fear the kingdom had him killed. Inside this building, the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, that's where Turkish officials say a hit squad was sent. A team of up to 15 people dispatched to kill this Saudi national and Washington Post columnist. Jamal Khashoggi is an outspoken and well-known critic of the kingdom, a man once close to the circles of power in Saudi Arabia, who more recently harshly criticized the royal family and the vast powers they wield. I got fired from my job twice as an editor of a leading Saudi paper. In self-imposed exile in the United States, Khashoggi spoke to CBC News earlier this year. It is a, a total closure when it comes to political and human rights activities in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's, there is a change in, uh, in, in social and uh, religious fronts, but uh, not when it comes to politics and, uh, and, and, and human rights. Now, friends and colleagues fear he's dead. This journalist says Turkish officials told him Khashoggi was murdered but provided no proof. Khashoggi went to the consulate last Tuesday to get some documents needed to marry a Turkish woman. His fiancée says she waited 11 hours outside the building, but he never came out. The Saudis, however, are adamant, saying Khashoggi was not killed and that he must have left the building. They took journalists on a tour through the consulate, opening up cabinets, even closets, trying to prove that Khashoggi is not there. We are working to search for him, says the consul general, and we are worried about his case. Khashoggi is an opinion columnist for the Washington Post. This is what the paper published a few days ago to mark his disappearance. This news if true, has us all completely devastated. This is an attack on us as well at the Washington Post. An investigation is now underway to try to find Jamal Khashoggi. If he's found dead, the Saudis will face intense global criticism and relations between Turkey and the kingdom, already strained, will hit a new low. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Jerusalem. Once, Khashoggi supported many of Mohammed bin Salman's reforms before becoming disaffected with his rule. The Nationals spoke with him in March about Saudi Arabia's problems and his own worries about the dangers of pointing them out. It was bitter for me to leave and uh, actually right after I left, uh, a rest began to happen. Many of my acquaintance, friends, colleagues were rounded up and... Uh, uh, I, I always regret being away from home, but when uh, uh, I see what happened to them, I, I, I think I did the right choice. I have, I have conflicted uh, feelings about the situation. I like many of the things MBS is doing. Actually, I called for openness. I called for uh, uh, an end to corruption, an end to radicalism. But at the same time, uh, I feel that we are moving, uh, shifting from Salafi or radic uh, religious radicalism to nationalist radicalism, that uh, you must like what I do, otherwise you are a traitor. And that is not the healthy environment that I was hoping for. Right now, there is no room for any political dissent, for any political uh, counter-opinions. The Canadian government has responded to all this, though without much detail. A spokesperson for Global Affairs issued a statement saying, we are aware and concerned by these reports. Canadian officials are actively seeking more information. But if this is proven to be a political killing, what might Canada say or do then? Not sure, but keep in mind, Canadian influence in Saudi Arabia is pretty weak right now. Relations tanked back in August after Canada tweeted a plea in Arabic urging for the immediate release of Saudi women's rights activists. The Saudis were infuriated and within hours started punishing Canada economically and politically. Cancelling flights, ordering investments be pulled and Saudi students sent home from Canadian universities. They also recalled 
their ambassador and ordered Canadian Ambassador Dennis Horak out of his post in Riyadh. Now, Horak has been silent about what happened until now. To sort of drop a tweet, as we did, in, in a vacuum with no bilateral relationship, really, to speak of. It, it's, it's, it's not effective, and, and it has repercussions. It's left, it left us vulnerable, and that's where we ended up. In an exclusive interview airing this Tuesday on The National, Horak talks about the price he thinks Canada paid to make a political point. If we don't have a relationship that allows us to go and talk to the people at the most senior levels, we're just yelling from the sidelines. We're yelling at people, get off our lawn. How the rift happened, what Canada can do about it, we get into all of it Tuesday exclusively on The National. To the U.S. now, where this was the moment Republicans had been waiting for for decades. When Brett Kavanaugh was sworn in late last night, Conservatives locked down their first solid majority on the U.S. Supreme Court since the 1930s. But oh, what it took to get there. You can still taste the bitterness of the fight over Kavanaugh in Washington, indeed across the country. And as Paul Hunter reports, it's not likely to leave anytime soon. Highlighting the fury in this country over Brett Kavanaugh, watch as a demonstrator sprays water at his convoy in disgust after Kavanaugh was sworn into the Supreme Court yesterday. I'm happy as a clam. Today, Republicans from Senator Lindsey Graham to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell offered a different view. While critics say the sexual assault allegations against Kavanaugh leave the court in a deeply politicized shadow, Republicans underline the right guy got the job. I'm happy that those who tried to destroy his life fell short. We stood up to the mob. We established that the, the presumption of innocence is still important. Meanwhile, Democrats emphasize none of this will be set aside. He's going to be on the Supreme Court with a huge taint and a big asterisk after his name. The next battlefield is the looming midterm elections. Days after mocking Kavanaugh's accuser, last night Donald Trump blamed Democrats for obstructing Kavanaugh's confirmation and urged his supporters to be sure to get out and vote against them. You don't hand matches to an arsonist, and you don't give power to an angry left-wing mob, and that's what they've become. The bitterness of the Kavanaugh debate has left many in this country frustrated and disillusioned with lawmakers. November is coming! Among those voicing that, now the Republican governor of Ohio. The pox on both houses for the way this was conducted, and people in the country are appalled. That's because it's like, I got to win and you got to lose. And it's amid all that that Brett Kavanaugh now takes his seat at the Supreme Court. He's expected to be in place by Tuesday in a country still deeply divided over whether he should even be there at all. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Within moments, it seemed, of the Senate confirmation vote to affirm Brett Kavanaugh as the next Supreme Court justice, he was sworn in. So why so fast? And what sort of cases await him on the bench? For that, we're joined by Alicia Bannon of the Brennan Center for Justice in New York, which advocates in part for voting rights. I, I know, Alicia, that you once clerked for Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who went on to be an Obama-era appointee to the Supreme Court. He now joins her uh, on that bench right away on Tuesday. What is your gut about the most controversial cases he'll likely see in his first session? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court is just starting its new term. It runs from October to June. Right now, we don't have too many blockbusters on the calendar. You know, in his first day on Tuesday, he's going to be hearing two cases interpreting a particular criminal statute. There are some cases, though, that are coming down the pipeline that look likely to land on the court's docket this term. One has to do with partisan gerrymandering, whether courts can step in and make states redraw their, their maps when they draw extreme partisan maps in, um, in district lines for congressional seats or state legislative seats. Another case that may be coming down the pipeline has to do with whether or not our anti-discrimination laws protect people on the basis of sexual orientation. So if a person is fired from their job because they're gay, whether or not they are protected. Is there any indication of, of how he would likely rule on, on that particular one? 
So one thing that's important to note is that his predecessor, Justice Kennedy, was a real swing vote on the U.S. Supreme Court. So we have a court, we have a court that's consistently been ruling in a lot of high salience cases on a five to four basis. So sometimes ruling with the left side of the court, sometimes ruling with the right. And very often, Justice Kennedy was that swing vote. So Justice Kavanaugh is going to be entering into a court that has been, you know, very frequently divided on a five to four basis. On the particular cases, partisan gerrymandering or LGBT rights, his record is pretty thin. He didn't hear any cases on those issues as a lower court judge. So we don't know a lot about his thinking on those particular issues. But looking at other cases that he's, he's heard as a lower court judge, as well as writing and speeches that he's given, we have a strong indication that he is, on many issues at least, a very conservative judge, far to the right of Justice Kennedy. So I think we are teed up to see a, a court move quite sharply rightward um, with, with Justice Kavanaugh. Okay, Alicia Bannon, thanks very much. Thank you. Canada is zooming towards its own legal revolution. Ten days from now, recreational pot becomes legal to smoke and to carry around. So what happens to the half million Canadians who've already been convicted of possession? Well, the NDP has tabled a private member's bill to have those records expunged, but as Briar Stewart explains, even if it passes, for many Canadians, that might not change much. This greenhouse is where we have our potted plants. Bob Woolsey grows marijuana to help alleviate his chronic pain. He first started using cannabis recreationally in his teens and in the 1970s was charged with possession three times. It really controlled how I approached the rest of my life. I, I, had, to, I had to look for jobs where they didn't require bonding, where they didn't require any sort of um, criminal check. When recreational marijuana is legal, adults will be able to carry up to 30 grams. That's why some legal experts believe those old convictions for possession should be cleared from criminal records. Under the current system, many can apply to have their convictions suspended, but most don't because of the cost and time involved. A lot of the people who have suffered from cannabis prohibition come from vulnerable communities and having access to that kind of money and uh, the sophistication to take themselves through the process can be a real barrier. Case number and then the right felony. That's what happened in California after marijuana was legalized. People weren't filling out the paperwork, so now the court there will do it automatically. So now jurisdictions across the state are automating this process so that folks are no longer having to go through the long, tough uh, process of petitioning on their own. The Canadian government says it will look at how to handle past convictions for minor possession once legal marijuana is fully in place. The buds are set. Woolsey believes Canada no shouldn't stop yet. there. He wants you know, them to look nice. at trafficking as well. As we That's what he was charged ball, with in 2015 when the RCMP now, shut down uh, an unregulated an dispensary he was running. They want to erase all the cannabis records right back to the 30s, get rid of them all. But even if some records are erased in this country, they will remain on American databases. Woolsey has been stopped at the border before, and he isn't hopeful that a change in Canada will make it any easier to enter the U.S. Briar Stewart, CBC News, DeRoche, BC. Some other developing stories we're keeping an eye on tonight. So, 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 so you That's about an estimated 3,000 people who marched in Montreal today. They're opposed to the incoming Quebec government's vow to ban the wearing of hijabs and other religious symbols in the workplace. They are also protesting the plan to reduce the number of immigrants allowed into the province. And in Brazil tonight, the far-right leader, Jair Bolsonaro, is a giant step closer to the presidency. He took a commanding lead over his competitor, despite a near-fatal stabbing last month. Bolsonaro's promised a crackdown on crime and corruption. A runoff election will be held on the 28th. Still ahead on the national, UFC fans are used to seeing bloody brawls inside the cage. But last night, the punches flew outside. What that means for the future of the sport ahead. Plus, why a cafe owner whose business was devastated by those tornadoes in Ottawa and Gatineau has a lot to be thankful for this weekend. And for almost 15 years, rapper and activist MIA has been taking pop political. Tonight, she sounds off in our Sunday interview.
when you come to England, they hadn't had Sri Lankan refugees before. So when we landed, people didn't know what we were. That man right there was mistakenly paid thousands of dollars in EI benefits. The government asked for it back, fair enough, but that's when bureaucracy conspired with sheer absurdity and nearly cost him thousands. Rosa Marcatelli from our Go Public team explains what happened. I didn't do anything wrong. But he still had to pay. That's what officials told Zygniew Kazmiakchuk after a government blunder put more than $14,000 worth of employment insurance payments into his checking account. He knew straight away he'd have to pay it back, but he never imagined he'd also be on the hook for thousands extra in taxes. Canada Services uh, admitted that uh, there was no ma fault on uh, my account, yet uh, uh, I had to give back to the government over $2,000. When we first met up with Zig, as he's known, he'd been laid off for a few months from his IT job. He'd applied for employment insurance and was told because he had a severance package, he wasn't eligible until 2019. But in May, Service Canada paid out anyway, then wanted the money back plus those taxes. Zig paid to avoid penalties, then filed two appeals to try to get the taxes back. Both were denied. Basically, their old position is that they do everything uh, according to the uh, procedures. What kind of procedures is that, that uh, if I didn't get a penny from EI, they ask me for 2,000 uh, more in return. I mean, that's unbelievable. This taxpayer's advocate says he often sees examples of bureaucratic rules that defy common sense. The issue here is there was a mistake that was made by Service Canada and it should be on Service Canada to fix that mistake. It should not be on uh, a totally innocent party that has nothing to do with the fact Service Canada screwed up. Go Public found the government incorrectly paid out or underpaid $239.5 million worth of EI benefits in the one-year period between 2016 and 2017. We also found many government agencies are failing to meet their own service standards. That includes processing times for claims, dealing with appeals, and especially access to call center agents. The government is trying to fix itself. In April, it introduced an initiative to improve services for Canadians. After Go Public contacted the government, it reversed its decision and returned the $2,000. Service Canada says it was able to do a refund through what's called a tax reversal, only because Zig's overpayment happened and then was discovered within the same calendar year. The government also told us that option was overlooked when Zig was trying to resolve the issue himself with the government. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. If you have a story you want investigated, email us, please, at gopublic at cbc.ca. Next on The National, we go in-depth with our Sunday interview why rapper and activist M.I.A. just needs to make her music political. I fly like girl, I if you catch me at the border, I go visit I think it's interesting when people are like, why are you talking about this? You know, just... Why do you want to talk about the fact that you came from the council flat or you're a refugee? You want to hear my story? I'm going to show you my story. This isn't a typical music documentary, and of course not M.I.A. isn't a typical musician. The British Sri Lankan rapper is known as much for her politics as she is for her playlist. Her career has been about moving the goalposts, the culture of identity politics, the desire to be heard, and just getting people to listen. All of that is stamped across a new film, Matangi Maya M.I.A. It opened this weekend in Canada. From the moment she burst onto the music scene in 2004, MIA's voice has been unapologetically fierce and fiercely unapologetic. 
You want to go, you want to win a war. Like PLO, I don't surrender. Stirring controversy with her lyrics and her videos, and not one to pass up the opportunity of a big stage to make a big statement. Super Bowl showdown over the big game's blockbuster halftime show. The NFL is now suing rapper MIA, but instead of issuing an apology, MIA is fighting back. The bigger the spotlight, the more MIA has stood up for the causes that drive her. From the global migrant crisis to women driving in Saudi Arabia. What experience are we allowed to share from these places? You've got access to a microphone. Please use it to say something. Always at the core of her music and her activism, her life as a Tamil refugee who grew up in London. What's that song about? Stereotypes. That's attached to like immigrants and stuff like that. It's that they come and take the jobs and take the money. Born Matangi Arupagrasam, she grew up as part of the ethnic minority Tamil community in northern Sri Lanka. Her father was one of the founders of the Tamil resistance in the lead up to a 25 year civil war. That conflict forced her to flee when she was just 10. When I was there, the war just started. So I remember it not being conscious of the fact that you're Tamil and then suddenly being really conscious of it because the war just started. So then when you come to England, they hadn't had Sri Lankan refugees before. So when we landed, people didn't know what we were. They had the bricks and rights in 81. And four years later, you come and it's still, there was a lot of racist tension, you know. So yeah, it was just like learning that, oh, you're something else and it's not even the thing that you really are. And you're just sort of lumped in this category of brown. Matangi became Maya, a refugee with an ambition to become a documentary filmmaker. How Maya then became MIA started with a phone call on the day she graduated from art school. I got a phone call saying my cousin is MIA and he, I, he and I went to school together when I was in Sri Lanka. And when he went MIA, I felt really guilty by that, you know, that somebody my age was and my favorite cousin had to make that decision to fight for, you know, his people. And that I was outside an art school, just graduating with a fine art degree and I didn't know what to do with it, you know? And it just sort of really knocked me sideways, you know? And that was the first time I felt really connected to back home to Sri Lanka and the concept of people like me and people my age and what they were doing there and I needed to go and investigate. When I was your age, I used to live in this room. What started as a journey to reconnect with her family and find her cousin who went missing during the war became something much bigger. That's you and that's my little brother. Two out of six boys are dead. There's a genocide going on. I felt that I'd not anticipated how terrible the situation was. I think Every day there was a new event and I was learning new things and the government had just bought these new fighter planes from Israel, the MiG-23 planes, and they were going on like a three-week offensive um, in Jaffna, which is the town I came from, which is why even in the movie, though I go to Sri Lanka, I still don't go back to my actual house in Jaffna because the government was bombing it every day. And they bombed the airport. Bloody world is looking at this. I don't understand. Even if I hear serious things like murders and rapes and genocide, 
it's still disposable, useless, and pointless, because nobody's doing anything about it. That was really an eye-opening moment for me, and that's why I was like, oh, this uh, needs more attention and this needs more help internationally. So that's effectively the origin story of MIA, a nod to the cousin she never found and the people she left behind. She made it her purpose to tell the world what was happening to Tamils in Sri Lanka, and that led to her most controversial video. This video for her song, Born Free, was temporarily banned from YouTube for its graphic nature. It was MIA's way of recreating real, uncensored videos of executions in Sri Lanka, replacing Tamils with redheads in America, just to get her message across. I need to keep the immigrant story in all my work, always, because that is what I'm trying to make sense of. We're users of scapegoat to flex it. We're users of scapegoat to build a wall. But people have always mixed and mingled and moved, and interesting things happen because of it. So, yeah, I think it's interesting when people were like, why are you talking about this? You know, just why do you want to talk about the fact that you um, came from the council flat or you're a refugee? Like, you know, just like be creative without having to talk about those things. But yeah, I, I'm just an artist that draws on real life and real experiences. Next on The National, the latest in our Seen and Heard series, 24-year-old Stefan Alexis has put his life on hold to help his parents care for his younger brother, Tor. But first, in case you missed it, Conor McGregor's triumphant return to the UFC last night was not exactly triumphant for him or for those fighting to defend the legitimacy of the sport. All right, sure, that looks like classic WrestleMania, but unlike pro wrestling, what erupted after last night's UFC lightweight title fight wasn't scripted, though some call it pretty predictable. After months of tension, defending champ Habib Nurmagomedov beat Conor McGregor in the octagon. Then he leapt over the fence and attacked McGregor's crew. Then Habib's boys entered the ring and went after McGregor himself, even though the fight was over. In the end, three people were arrested. Chaotic, of course, surprising. Not according to those who follow UFC. If something happens, like what happened in April, when Conor McGregor flew to Brooklyn from Ireland with a bunch of his mates uh, and decided to attack a bus that carried Khabib, then uh, the UFC could have said, right, we're not going to condone this. Or they can just say, right, you know what? We're going to make as much money as possible from this. And that's what they did. But if that's the path you're going to go down, then you can't be shocked and surprised when something like this happens. Habib's $2 million payday is now in question, pending an investigation, so not great for him. Nor UFC head, Dana White, who's taking heat for letting things get so ugly. But for UFC's more extreme fans, maybe last night's madness was the payday. Tonight on our Seen and Heard series, an intimate portrait of sacrifice and frankly brotherly love. Stefan Alexis has put his life on hold to care for his younger brother, Tor, who has cerebral palsy. Now, many young Canadians have a similar story. More than a million and a quarter of them are caring for a loved one, sometimes at the expense of their own futures. So here's what it's like caring for Tor. Are you okay? I remember, like, when we were at the hospital, like, very clearly. We waited there for a while, and then my dad came out and he was like, your brother's here. I got to see him from the class. I remember seeing other kids that were Tor's age, and they were, like, crawling and walking. And I was like, so when is Tor gonna 
start walking and talking, they're like, probably you won't be able to walk and talk. I must have been at around like four or five years old when I realized that things were a little different. Stefan Alexis, 24 years old. This is a team effort. There we go. <laughs> it tickles. <laughs> I'm a young caregiver. I take care of my younger sibling, Torrance. He is 21 years old and he has cerebral palsy. He's not verbal. Um, he doesn't really have any balance. He's completely dependent. <laughs> You wanna go to bed? You wanna go to bed? It's not an easy job. He, is, he needs like he needs you for everything. So you have to be taking care of him 24 7. I think Tora sees the world simpler than, than we see it. So I feel like he appreciates the things that we take for granted. We think he sees the world in lights and shapes. Okay, buddy. A year ago when Tor turned 21, um, he graduated from high school and all the services stopped. So um, when that happened, uh, we didn't have any uh, support during the day. You're doing well. You're doing and really all good. the work kind of fell on my dad. Yeah, you should be hungry though. So that's when I was like, okay, hey, I have to help. Mom's working full time, has her hands full, taking care of the house too, so. I'm here. Even though I wasn't like feeling great, it's you make sacrifices for your family. When people think about a caregiver, they generally think about a female. It's a very easy um, assumption to make and a very easy picture to paint. Watching my dad taking care of Tor um, has impacted me in a pretty significant way because he's shown me the other side of masculinity. He teaches me how you're supposed to be attentive to certain things and how you're supposed to like take care of your family. So I'm picking up, okay, passata sauce, pepperoni, spinach, eggs. I'll be back. When you're taking care of a family member, the house revolves around that family member. So you kind of have to coordinate who's gonna stay and who's gonna go out because everything is, it's like an orchestra. So you have to, Kind of get everything in a certain balance. Time to go to bed, Torrance. Go on, sweetheart. Turn around. There's so many little intricate details that go not into like just everyday life, but into a life where you're taking care of someone else. Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me. We love Tora to death. We love him unconditionally. We, we would do anything for him, of course, but any kind of long, continuous strain has an impact on you mentally. My friends are aiming towards like their career and they're 
chasing like their dreams and all that. Having to put my goals and aspirations on the back burner can be really frustrating. I can't do this forever. Um, and um, it's a tough, it's a tough place to be in because like what do I, do I pay, like how do I choose? <laughs> what will happen like if I'm not there to kind of relieve the pressure? Everyone's getting older and the needs are going up and it's kind of, it's breaking the balance. He just had a really bad seizure. You ready? You good? Okay. Let me come on, give you a hand. If I can't be here, like, physically to help, I need to find another way to help out. easy ignoring these people because there's no voice. Because the people that have the voice are too tired to like raise their voices. They're already exhausted from the day to day and they don't have the energy to go out and protest. try and like fight the government and like lobby and do all this crazy stuff because like the day to day never really stops. You don't have the energy because you're just trying to make it day to day. <laughs> <laughs> that was just one chapter in our Seen and Heard series, and each one gives you an intimate look at a young person leading an extraordinary life. You can check them out at youtube.com slash CBC The National. Here are some stories we'll be watching on The National this week. Are you ready for the second royal wedding of the year? Of course you are. Princess Eugenie marries Jack Brooksbank on Friday. Now, she's the younger daughter of Prince Andrew and the Duchess of York. He is the manager of a tequila brand. Their wedding at St. George's Chapel won't have quite the hoopla of Harry and Meghan's ceremony at that very chapel. For economists around the world, it might as well be Christmas Eve. They will wake up tomorrow morning learning who has won the Nobel Prize. We will also be hearing from Nadia Murad. The Yazidi human rights activist is speaking to the media tomorrow for the first time since being named a co-winner of the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize. Imagine if I never met the broskis. God's plan. God's plan. So, God's plan, Drake might be hoping God's plan, includes an American Music Award. The Canadian megastar is up for eight awards Tuesday night, including Artist of the Year. Fellow Canadian Sean Mendez will be performing on the show. And Ottawa Business is giving thanks this holiday weekend. The Heart and Soul Cafe, so aptly named, was damaged during the six tornadoes that tore through the community almost two weeks ago. They've been working hard to get back up and running ever since. They managed to open their doors to community leaders and loyal customers just in time for Thanksgiving. And that, of course, is our moment of the day. For this Thanksgiving, I'd have to say me and the family are just happy that we, were man we managed to get it open. 
We chose this weekend to open strictly because we wanted to get it done as quickly as possible. We wanted to get back open for the customers. We were really busy this opening. We had an incredible turnout. It's been an incredibly long couple of weeks just trying to rebuild the sensibility of normal, get everybody back to work and get everything organized, cleaned up. There was such a great turnout of volunteers and everybody there just doing what it had to be done to help out and get everything back to the way it was. I'm also thankful that I actually have a roof over my head because Frankly, I'm off lucky compared to a lot of people out here and I just hope that the volunteering keeps going and we get this community back together again as soon as possible. So a couple of things you need to know about this place. It's been open for decades. They fed people even at the worst of times and you may have seen a picture of a tree sort of collapsing on, onto what looked like a tent there. That was a yurt that, that controlled or what housed their gift shop. Because they had no power, they luckily sent someone home from that yurt just about half an hour before the tornado. So lots of mercies to be thankful for today. That is a national for Sunday, October the 7th. Good night.